Eric McGarrity and Peter Corbin are involved with a project called Smart Communities New Brunswick. The idea is to apply new technology and large-scale databases to help with collective decision-making. Our conversation ranged from seniors and their needs to public transportation to how do we make New Brunswick a better place. Hope you enjoy the conversation. So thanks for coming. Both of you are busy souls, so we have an hour to play with this notion of smart communities. Um, we want to do the quick intro first for what a smart community is, and then we'll play with some of the language and, and its potential. Sure. And Eric, do you want to go first? Or shall I no, go you first? go ahead. Okay. Um, so a lot of us have probably heard of the term smart city. And a smart city, a lot of people would define it as using things like the Internet of Things to focus on helping with things like uh, public transit or infrastructure, mostly uh, framed around larger cities like Toronto and Tokyo and Berlin. What we're doing with smart communities, really, really focusing on people in the community and uh, work, working from the problems towards the solutions, not the other way around. So we're framing this as a smart community uses technology and big data wisely to improve the social, economic, and environmental fabric of those communities hmm. in one sentence, basically. Hmm. All right. Thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I, I, yeah Peter's spot on. And what, what I can add to that is is there's a big movement right across the world. Uh, there's a lot of countries that are, are into the smart city technologies. But when we when we brought it here, we thought, well, no, it's, it's more than just the eight cities in New Brunswick. It's every community so that's why we come up with smart smart communities and that brings us with connections to the smaller communities and and the bigger communities and working together because in this province we need to work with partners hmm. Hmm. so one thing that comes to mind right off the bat other than the semantics because we'll get to that later is that new brunswick's so small by population seven hundred fifty thousand people so you mentioned off the big cities and how they can integrate services or some sort of major data sets into better decision making. Surely to goodness, 750,000 people can find a way to integrate all of this. Is that part of the, the intent? I think it's a journey. Okay. And you don't wake up on Monday morning and say, okay, by Friday, we're going to be a smart community. Yeah. So you have to focus on different aspects of, of, of life, uh, not just in the communities, but also uh, like Eric said, in the, in the urban areas as well as the rural areas, yeah. uh, but also uh, different aspects of life, whether it's uh, you know social inclusion, um, new Canadians, how do we integrate uh, them better into the community, attracting new Canadians, immigration, mm -hmm. uh, energy, economic development, tourism, uh, transit uh, issues, uh, access to internet. Yeah. So all of these issues kind of come together and connect. So the question is, how can we identify opportunities uh, in various communities and what's scalable. So something can be solved in Edmonston or Miramichi, maybe it can also be solved in Bathurst and Sussex and Fredericton as well, for example. So mm -hmm. really linking them all together and in doing so, bring a lot of efficiencies uh, from a solution perspective to make them uh, more cost efficient and effective for smaller communities. Okay. At, at this point, it probably would help to have an example because that's, that's like brochure talk, which is great. It sure. used the big framing and stuff. Um, most of us have a list of things that we want to see better in New Brunswick. Many of the guests have come on and said, well, we need to do this better, that better. They're very good at defining the problem, um, getting at the solution sometimes. Different story. As a, as yeah. a, you know, we know what, but how becomes another challenge. Um, so is this specifically IT world applied to social relationships? For lack, like, it, where's the bridge between the IT part, the smart yeah, sure. part, because that's the context you mean smart in, to all the stuff that we live with, like, every day from transportation improvements to traffic patterns to crime to how to help business community thrive. Yeah. Can you bridge? Well, yeah, yeah. There's it, you, you use the technology to bridge the social part of it. And and there's a couple a couple of things with that is, And just before we get into that, let's go back to what, it is the Internet of Things, but it's, we call it the smartness of everything. So everything a community, a city, a town, a village, or an LSD does, they have to be smarter today mm. and be more efficient. No doubt about it, especially in this province. We know what's up we're up against, so yeah. why can't we, as, as smart communities, work together and provide services uh, to everybody? Uh, now, uh, for example, on the transportation, mentioned transportation end is, 
is how do we get people that, that live outside our cities that have to go to doctor's appointments, or legal appointments, or appointments in the cities, but can't access our bus service. Yep. Bus services are very expensive. I don't think there's a bus service in Canada and North America that, that pays for itself. Yep. So it's all subsidized by, by local government, yep. sometimes provincial governments. Uh, in this province, we don't have a provincial transportation policy yet. Hmm. Hopefully, we'll get that. So it's moving people that, that in. To complicate that is we have a very aging population. As you know, a lot of our younger workers are, are going to where the jobs are, mm -hmm. especially out west. So that means in smaller communities, the the mean age is up to like 50 or 55. Mm -hmm. So these people are in their communities. They don't have that support. Their families are out west or in the States or yep. overseas. Yep. So how do we help them out and how do we get them into the services in the city? So... There's, there's companies out there with smaller buses, feeder buses to hit our bigger buses in the city. That puts people on our buses. That helps us on, on the bottom line, less subsidization because we're, we're, we're getting more people to use it. So it's, you know, we there's different things you can do there too. It's it's a lot. We have to look at that. That's one one area where we, we I think we can, we can get a gain. Uh, the other one is uh, it, it, when you talk about smart cities, you have your framework, and then you have sensors. And sensors collect data, data, data. So that data is collected, it's analyzed, <coughs> and if you're a politician, you, you get better data. Yep. And what better data is, is you're more informed, you mm -hmm. make better decisions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, we could have street lights in cities. That can instead of being a street light, they could be cameras. They can. Uh, I know in some state uh, places in the states they. They pick up gunshots. Hopefully we don't have that type of problem here. We're far from that. Yeah. But these are some of the things that can be explored. Uh, that, uh, and I think if you can, if I, I'm always a big proponent of, of keeping people safe in their neighborhood and enjoying their property. So you get mm -hmm. right down to the neighborhoods and some of this technology will, will help that social thing. Mm -hmm. Thoughts add to that? I'm starting to get a picture. Right. So means maybe the audience is starting to get yes. pictures. So it's good because yeah. it's, it's a big picture thing. So to narrow it down to some specifics is helpful. Right. Like Eric said, I, it, you, you do have to break it down to specifics, right? So, for example, um, I was talking to a young man who is uh, doing his Ph.D. at University of New Brunswick in St. John. He's from Iran originally, and he got, he got brought to St. John to focus on urban planning. And he has been looking around the globe for really effective applications to help improve the efficiency and request for specific items for food banks. Mm -hmm. Apparently it doesn't exist. There's one in London that doesn't get used well. So what he would like to see is an application that would engage citizens and communities to actually let them know exactly what's needed when. So almost a real time delivery of specific items or food items uh, such as you know socks or blankets or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, so there's there's one example, just sort of connecting people. <coughs> so there are a lot of lot of applications like that from a connection perspective. Another example could be just for your neighborhood. There are applications out there that can they're, they're basically like a, a private social network for your neighborhood. Hmm. So in the event, for example, of an extreme weather event, um, who's got what assets that people could use? Maybe you don't know the person three doors down. Yeah. Maybe you do, but if you don't. They may have a generator you could, you know, perhaps borrow to keep the food from yep. from uh, from uh, rotting in your fridge. So a lot of examples at the neighborhood level. Um, there, there's just a couple right there. Yeah, and it, you could easily picture it could go on. You pick a topic and then go three questions deep and you'll go tuk, 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 and this is how it would work. Exactly. So, so it won't matter the topic. The process will be more interconnectivity between people. And it yes. sounds like real time, too, to an element. Um there was a company that used to be in Fredericton a few years ago. He was working on, a, I can't remember his name now, live streaming data for hospital management over in India. Hmm. And, and the whole notion of that any manager at any given time in a major hospital in India could go in, hit some buttons, and find out how many towels there were or how many syringes there were or from inventory right down to patient movement through. But it was like an instant snapshot every moment instead of um, your information's sort of older. Right. There's there's actually a company in Moncton and Fredericton, a startup, a young lady called Amanda Betts, and her company's called eHealth Chart. So her family run a couple of um, uh, 
homes for our elderly. Mm -hmm. And she was looking for an application that would help their caregivers mm -hmm. know what's going on with their care. Like, well, it's my mother, you know, is her, is her uh, medications being delivered on time? Yeah. What's her, you know, um, yep. how's her health doing? There's nothing out there she liked. So she, like, remember Leah Okoka said, I was so impressed I bought the company. She, she was so not impressed. She <laughs> built a company. So she's now developed this application specifically for keeping caregivers in the loop with respect to the health care for their, for their uh, parents. One of the conversations I had with John McGarry two years ago on uh, New Brunswick health care delivery, it was just before he retired from uh, CEO of Horizon. And he talked to how New Brunswick was really well suited for regional health care model and in regional health care delivery. His obstacle was an emotional one uh, that from the 60s, we have a culture here of depending on uh, my community needs to have a hospital. And the hot button issue two or three summers ago was the St. Stephen Hospital and retooling the structure of its purpose as well as aligning some services in St. Stephen or in uh, St. John. What came up through the conversation with different people after that interview was that the real solution to the next level of challenge was the transportation one. So when you talked about transportation moving people, a lot of people in St. Stephen had no problem with the hospital morphing into whatever the new iteration would be because they accepted the logic of the efficiency of the bigger hospital handling certain amount of elective surgeries. Where they were stuck was that nobody addressed their transportation problem from coming from here to going to there. So is that another example of where something like this might help build bridges and deliver uh, maybe an entrepreneurial bus service that deals with from here to here? Actually, there is a bus service now from Charlotte County to St. John. Is there? Yeah, it started up, I think, last fall. So, yeah, there is a bus service now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there, it, there's, there's things like Uber out there that you know, they, they, I don't think they're really established here. So we have to look at that park and go rise. But it's these maybe these smaller services extending into the communities that somebody needs to get to their doctor and their doctor is 50 kilometers away in a, in a bigger community if you're going to shut down your hospital then you re, you have to, and you're right you have to provide that that person a way to get to them to, yeah. to their appointments and it's 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 a necessary thing that's what i'm saying we have to look at the transportation and it's going to be a regional a provincial transportation mm -hmm. system so do, do, Just not there yet, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's planting the seeds right now and yeah. trying to get a conversion of a behavior, which is a whole other theme to talk about because technology might invite us into a certain awareness, but people have to change how they've been doing things for a while, and that's another challenge. Do you have off the top of your heads what you think the four or five key areas or two or three key areas would be to go at first? So transportation comes up pretty quickly. Are there other areas that you know, you know, we've got this great concept, we've got to figure out... Uh, how to implement it, but if we can have success if we focus on these two or three areas first, so people start to understand how this works. I think there are quick wins, quick wins, and long-term wins as well, and I think some of them should be looked at in parallel. Okay. So, for example, we talked about uh, you know the top four or five issues in general that I would I would suggest are uh, good quality internet access, especially in rural areas and mm -hmm. some urban areas, um, resiliency in communities with respect to extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. Aging population, mm -hmm. uh, transportation, and economic development. I'd say they were the top five. Okay. And they, I think they are all related to each other. So I wouldn't say let's focus on transportation. When you say focus on transportation, uh, maybe there are, transportation may be a solution to a problem. You haven't asked enough questions to find out what the problem is yet. Yeah. Where transportation could be part of the solution. Yeah. So, for example, up in Edmonston, uh, they've got a booming economy up there. They can't find people up there. They've got a number of manufacturing co companies up there. They can't find employees. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you look around the 20 or 30 kilometer radius around Edmonston, there are a lot of people that could work if they had transportation, right? So maybe there's a private sector solution there, perhaps. Yep. Uh, if you look at, uh, you mentioned earlier, Charlotte County and the hospital, perhaps like you said, you change the paradigm a bit and you look at how you actually help a lot of people um, especially from an elderly uh, person uh, perspective, how do you help them uh, age in place longer, healthier, and safely as well? Yep. So there are a lot of technologies today available to create what I would call a smart home for seniors. Mm -hmm. So not just physical um, things like you know door handles and non-slip floors and, and that kind of thing, but also technologies that can monitor uh, you know someone's health from a you know heart rate, 
uh, and, and activities and behaviors in the home. So perhaps there are things that can be done in a home that could actually be proactive with respect to addressing health concerns mm -hmm. that may that may reduce the amount of necessary trips to a hospital in the first place, as an example. So basically using IT to decentralize some of the more proactive uh, potential health care um, assistance. What you say complements what Karen Lake said on the show two, three weeks ago about in-home care and the use of new technologies to help the person stay at home longer. And we have to dig down. It's when you talk about a, an aging population and seniors, and we have to change the, the dialogue that's going on. And once you start changing the dialogue, you change the attitude. Yeah. So people are, you know, you, you hear, uh, oh, the silver tsunami, we're at the, the, the aging, uh, we're on the cliff. The, you know, people are looking at the negative aspects. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff is not really based on anything scientific or financial. So flip that around and look at the opportunity. Yeah. Look at seeing you being an opportunity. We have a whole cohort of people retiring. Yeah. Young and, and the baby boomers. And as you know, Dennis, baby boomers, everything we're into always change. They yeah. want to change. Yeah. And I can tell you this, change is going to happen with how we retire. Because the more we do now, and the city has a great committee working on this, it's better for the kid born because they're going to retire that much better. Yeah. And when you look at those negative aspects, is flip that, look at the opportunities. I just came from an event uh, volunteer, uh, Fredericton, uh, we were working, our race training committee in the city, working with them to primetime volunteers. Mm -hmm. You might have heard about it. Hmm. Is people retiring and volunteer on your own time. Yeah, there's a, an app out that was launched today. You go on the site and you pick uh, the organization, you put your particulars in, and then you have your, your choices come up. So it makes it even easier. Yeah. And it's good for the volunteer associations like United Way, Alzheimer's. They can go in and they can put what their needs are. So somebody, it matches. We call it V Harmony. Yeah. So it's just v, sure. You said V Harmony. V, yeah, v, v Harmony. Harmony. You gotta be careful about that. It's have, not about dating. Don't, have, have don't slip in, with a letter there. That's yeah. it. And have yeah. some integrity when you fill out their profile. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But it's a little hope that somebody remembers that. So they go on that site and say, well, "Listen, yep. I'd like to work. Uh, I, I get a few hours, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be involved with people. So I wanna get uh, Meals on Wheels." Yep. Who, by the way, does great work because yeah. when you talk about the social part, they're the connection between yeah. the outside world and the inside world. The people that that can't get out, and they, when they go in their house, they can say eh, something's not right. So they're trained enough to say, no, we need somebody in there to find out what's going on. Maybe it's a health thing. Or yeah, this might seem like a, a vague question, but listening between the gaps of what both of you are describing. Um, and Peter, you alluded to it earlier, like you could focus on a specific thing like transportation, but that might not be the solution to the problem. It might be a piece of it. Correct. Just like you mentioned meals and wheels. It, yeah, there's the food element, but the social element, the human contact element, exactly. yeah, all those things. So are we almost at the point yet where we can start asking a different set of questions? So instead of asking, how do we improve public transportation? How do we improve quality? You know, can we get into, are we happy? Or do we have the quality of life in the community we need? You know, those those funny, odd, yeah. touchy-feely, broad-based questions sometimes get you into the spot where all those other ones congregate. Rather than, oh, we're going to talk about food security, and then you're quickly going to find transportation and storage issues right around it. So it feels like uh, we never get off the treadmill for how to fix it. So sometimes if you pull back and ask a different kind of question, all those pieces now start to want to fit into a pattern at last. And it sounds like this technology might give us a perspective that gives us a sense of a pattern. Well, I... I you kind of get where I'm going yeah, with that? Yeah, when you say quality of life, to me, quality of life should be right in the middle of the circle. Yeah. Right? And when you talk about quality of life, I mean, there are a lot of jobs available in this city and in this province. The cost of real estate... You know, compared to say Vancouver, Man. you know we can buy a home in in New Brunswick for the price of the HST and a home in Vancouver, right? It's yeah. probably three times the size. Yeah. Uh, but I would, um, I'll give you an example of quality of life. This this may seem menial, but the hotspot parking app, okay. for example, right? It's a number of cities. It's founded here in Fredericton. To me, that adds to my quality of life because <laughs> when I park, I don't have to worry about getting a parking ticket. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to worry about schlepping around change because yeah. most people just use, you know, plastic now anyway. So to me, 
the feature is, yeah, you can pay for your parking uh, with with an app. Hmm. But the benefit is, I got peace of mind when I park, and if I feel I got to, if I'm going to be there longer, I just got the little ping that says, okay, you're going to park a little longer. You say yes. So I think there's so many little aspects, not little, but a number of aspects that can contribute towards improving your quality of life. Mm-hmm. And you, I think you hit the nail on the head with respect to what these types of technologies can do uh, from a f- fulfilled and, and, and happy life. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's so many solutions, I think, out there that can address little bits of your life, yeah. right? Your, your overall life, but also specific uh, things that you may do at any given point in the day. So another thought that surfaces is an uh, issue of access. Um, is this going to be something that only people that can afford it can do? Or is there a way of structuring it that it, it's actually working with organizations rather than individuals so that the organization can help the individual? Because when you say rural access to internet, for example, that's an ongoing issue in New Brunswick for 30, 40 years. Across the country. And, and, yeah, and, and it's a challenge, yeah. and there was ExploreNet that kind of gave it a pop and stuff, but then technology keeps changing, how do you keep up with speeds, and, and it's a beast. So is it is it something that's not for the elites, but those that have access, or will it be kind of everyone will be able to access um, things that will help their quality of life in a smart community? Well, it's, 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 let's go back in time where when you talk about the internet, it's, it's a way of getting around now. Yeah. So when you go back, it was paths and, and dirt roads, and all of a sudden there was the first paved roads, and I, I'm just reading some books on in New Brunswick with some of the first paved highways. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now we get highways and, and double-lane highways, but now it's, it's, it's the, the internet. That's, you know, because you could sit here and you could broadcast and talk to somebody yeah. Three quarters away around the world, yeah. and have the conversation. So instead of somebody jumping on a plane, coming here, hotel, at all the costs, yeah. you're you're talking, and yeah. and and that's as a, as a society, that's where we're going. Uh, uh, on the social end of it, I think um, when you talk about seniors and youth, and, and and this goes back, to, and I wanted to jump into the conversation is 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 self esteem. You know, somebody that doesn't have a job, they, they, they get into a rut and it's it's hard to come out. They have to, everybody wants to be useful to do something. Mm-hmm. Right? And and just because somebody retires, it gets all, oh, we're, we're sidelining all that experience. Well, why couldn't they mm-hmm. come back and help people like in, in the schools that are struggling with math or, or you know, if somebody wants to be a lawyer, they can, you know, there, there's, that information, you know, and, and Peter said, well, down at uh, the Red Lantern Tavern, uh, there's a group of people that are going to talk about Law 101. They want to go down, jump in. I don't need a certificate. I don't yeah. need anything. <laughs> but I, if I want to go to university and I talk to some of the university people, said, I want to go, but I don't want to. I don't want a degree. I just want to sit in and talk to people with like interests. Yep. Where whatever it is, you know, if you know, if it could be astrology, it could be archaeology. But I mean, you're learning something, yep, and you're attached to something, and that's where we have to get at. So, uh, s- smart city, smart communities are about partnerships. We've got a, some great universities here, and right here is a big living lab. Mm-hmm. So, the city's been talking to when we lost all those trees at, at when Arthur blew through, like, I, we never put a dollar value on. So they come up and they put a dollar value. It was about eight hundred million dollars. That's a huge loss. Yeah. So we turned to the county and said, "Do we appreciate that or do we depreciate that?" <laughs> yeah. They were scratching their heads. Yeah. Well, right? maybe it doesn't even fit in the accountant's yeah. ledger. You know, so maybe it's a it, another it's, thing. That's right. It's it's well something new, something different, and yeah. you know. Uh, so it's creating those relationships that if we can say, look. You, You've got your students there. Bring them in and get some experience right in the living lab in the yeah. cities and yeah. in some of the small communities. Yeah. St. Thomas University, with the age friendly come in, they come in and from the social work group, they help us out. Uh, and I know uh, the Red Sox College at UMB have come in and, and and they're helping out. So, I mean, it's it's creating those connections. It's like a big, uh, the old uh, telephone operators, are, yeah. are con- you got to start connecting them. <laughs> yep. Talk, you know? Yep. Everybody and every community. So why can't uh, the village of Toketown have a problem? They know St. John's done a lot of work. They get on the phone and talk it and say, listen, can you help us? Sure. Yeah. 
That's what we're going to get at. Yeah. So to, to build on that, sorry, for, with, the, with respect to access, um, I think you can also look at it in the context that the technology could help improve hmm. uh, quality of life for those that may not have access yet. Hmm. I'll give you two examples. One earlier was the food bank one, right? So using technology that's not necessarily accessed uh, by that population uh, to help them access, you know, certain things to help their quality of life. But I'll give you one other example. Uh, in Parkland County, Alberta, which is a few kilometers west of Edmonton, it's a rural community, so it's about 60,000 population. There's one uh, city in it, sorry, town, about 30,000 population, very rural. And uh, there's a young lady out there who looks after the internet service uh, for the county. It's more than just, you know, Rogers or Telus or, or Bell or whatever, but she's basically their landlord on 20 towers in this county. And they're using the internet to enable access itself. So, for example, one of the things that they do uh, for the less fortunate is you can actually sign out uh, at Internet Hub, so basically Wi-Fi for your house for a week, out of the library. Mm -hmm. And uh, also you can sign out a, 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 a laptop as well discreetly. It's a Google a Chrome laptop. But you can actually sign out of the library, Internet Access. So I think there's a lot of ways these tools can be used in the back end Good. to help improve accessibility long term as well yeah because yeah. one of the why i asked that question is one of the great challenges with implementing some changes and we need to start making some changes is how do we get everyone in on it at more or less the same time so that there's the social equity issue that continues to dominate you know, because that's one of those higher perspective lenses that we look through and go, well, we're fixing this and fixing that, but we still have an inequity issue. So that would kind of show that. That's why I wanted it at the surface. I would show that this is going to be for everyone, not just for those that can afford the, the new $1,000 phone and can put in all the apps and, and have the wherewithal, the literacy, to know how to manage all that. So if libraries and community access points for and getting access to the technology without it being an overhead cost for your household because you got to cover off your groceries because the heat bill was higher. Right. Know, that dynamic. Um, so that's a good message to get out early in this exercise. It's about the whole community um, coming together. It is 100% about the whole community. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you mentioned change, and the only thing that won't change is change yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, back when the province started these access centers, when computers were coming online, not everybody in every home could afford a computer. Yep. So throughout the province, the, the I, I think it was an excellent program, the, the province were setting these access centers. So you can go in and use the internet, research, it was for, for kids and that. And I remember going to the, Frederick, uh, to the uh, Northside Library, and we had a grant to put an access center in. Hmm. So the technology teacher at the time said, well, we could use a room, but the library would be perfect. You know, kids go in, they do research, they write their essay there. You know, old technology, new technology, it's a changeover. Yep. So when we met with a few members of the board, they they, they thought we they looked, at, looked at us as if they had three eyes. <laughs> they didn't, no, no, you can't do this, and we get no staff for that, and I said, okay, so we went with plan B, have a plan B. There was this, a room in the Nassau Sis Middle School. That's where it was. It was next door to the tech teacher. Everything worked fine. Within seven or eight months, Bill Gates came in and said, we're giving computers away free to libraries. <laughs> Guess what? The library was now in business. So, yeah. But then again, changes hit again, and computers are more access. Our, the phones now are like computers, so yeah. therefore these access centers have have lost their importance because now it's people can get on the internet more. It's yeah. more accessible. So that's, that's change and change again. So yeah. you got to get one step ahead, two step ahead, and try yeah. to get be a little visionary about it. And yeah. Where are we going with this stuff? And a slight change in direction of conversation. Um, can you walk us into some nuts and bolts of how it works? So we've talked, you know, broad brush social stuff, some examples of where it might apply, but we haven't got into. Um, you know, what is a large data set? How do you build a large data set? How do you start mining that data set? Because that's got to be one element to what this does. Because mm -hmm. there's a desire for humans to know what's going on. And all the way back to Darwin, and he's got to record everything he's looking at, right? So there's a, something in us that wants to know all the pieces. Or if it's 
some people when they go clothes shopping they have to touch every piece of fabric on the rack before they decide what's on that they want right <laughs> yeah. there's something in us that needs to know that before we can make a decision or consider we're making an informed decision does this help with that part of the human nature of all of this i will give you two examples of partially human nature but also can relate to quality of life again uh, one is um, you hear on the headlines when there's an extreme weather event you know, when uh, that flooding happened in Perth Andover a few years ago, a number of homes had to be moved. Mm -hmm. There was a physical cost to that. Or the ice storm in the peninsula last year, there was, you know, so many millions of dollars worth of infrastructure lost. Yep. You see on the front page of the paper the cost to the physical infrastructure. You do not see the cost to the healthcare system or those individuals from a physical and mental health perspective. So, for example, when you talk about big data, uh, the University of New Brunswick through the, and I'll never get this acronym right, MBIRDT. Basically, uh, UMB is now housing big data from the province and a lot of healthcare records, for example. Now, they are they are protected. They are secure from, from a privacy mm -hmm. perspective. But imagine now, so this is actually a project that Dr. Louise Camo, who I'm sure you know at UMB, is interested in doing, is now looking at the mental, uh, the co cost from a mental and physical health perspective related to extreme weather events. So, for example, you see on the front page of the paper, $10 million or whatever for, for Perth Andover, but what was the cost to the healthcare system as a result of that? Perhaps there are a lot of people that are still suffering uh, from, from anxiety as a result of this. Maybe every spring, you know, their anxiety goes up and they're going to the doctor. There's a hard cost there, right? Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about the individual from their uh, health uh, perspective but also, quite frankly, the, the cost of the healthcare system is one example, not to mention incidents with, you know, is, is, uh, is Johnny okay in his house or there are issues around, you yeah. know, uh, gas poisoning or whatever. So there's a use where big data can be married against uh, what can happen to improve resiliency in, in a community, as mm -hmm. an example. Yeah. Another similar one, we talked about the aging population earlier and wanting to help people um, live in their homes longer safely. So the three big issues uh, generally are uh, the risk of a fall, uh, dementia, and uh, a pill cocktail. Either you take the wrong drugs at the right time or not enough or enough or whatever. So again, from a big data perspective, and we're talking a lot of healthcare data here, right? So imagine now you're doing a, an experiment where you have uh, a few hundred homes with people living in them where you've outfitted those homes with a lot of physical and technological uh, aids to live in those homes more safely and compare that population over time to a popular similar demographic without those aids and then it's difficult to measure the cost of a fall that doesn't happen yes right but yes. statistically uh, over time you're going to be able to if you've got enough of a population in this you're going to be able to see what the difference is so now you're helping a population uh, live live at home longer more safely but in the, the back end, so with no access to data, but you've now got the data available through what we're doing in New Brunswick mm -hmm. to be able to measure the potential cost savings to the healthcare system as a result of doing that. So mm -hmm. that could be a substantial, substantial improvement mm -hmm. uh, to the cost of healthcare in the province. Now imagine taking that one step further and once we've developed that expertise here, assuming it would be uh, um, um, economically feasible, which I think it would be, mm. you've now established a center of excellence for that type of approach that you can export to other markets. So we're actually creating an economic opportunity out of what we perceive to be a real issue. Yep. It's a bit of a curve, but it also hovers right there too. New Brunswick is famous for its one degree of separation, like we've talked about before the show. So we all know each other somehow. It takes three minutes when we meet someone new and do you know so-and-so. And at the same time, that has never given us an advantage for getting on with large scale for New Brunswick social change. Um, has or has not? Hasn't. Okay. Because because we'll talk about, well, we're smaller, we can be the petri dish, we can be the place where the experiment happens, like you just described. But we're also stuck. Amalgamation is a great example of where we Sussex Corner just couldn't figure it out with Sussex. The Up Riverview and Moncton have its long history of trying to get past some history and get into what the new version looks like. Fredericton in our outlying areas will always talk about internal city services and external costs. And so somewhere in there, I started to wonder when doing my homework, will something like this technology and application technology and you doing your dots, you know, all these yep. pins, will we finally manage to get past the human element that 
New Brunswick, 750,000 people. And if we can figure out how to get not all on the same page, but mostly on the same page, then the little province could make a huge leap forward. We could have had a, an airport 25, 30 years ago, but the three mayors just couldn't find common ground with it. They were each busy representing their turf. And a moment kind of came and went. We, we could have had a whole other infrastructure in place the past 25 years. Those examples, you know, yeah. it's the human side to the application yeah. of right. what this could be. Yeah. Just speaking on that, you get to drill down. And let's really <laughs> drill down. <laughs> Good. Right? Well, that's what we're Real here for. Real drill down. What, and, and you get at ground zero. And ground zero is trust. And we've talked about that. It's trusting communities with communities and cities. It's it's uh, uh, English, French, small community, large community. Uh, you know, when you go through all that, it's, sit down at the table and say, okay, it's 10 to 12. We get 10 minutes on, on our clock to figure this out. Because if we don't, somebody else is going to figure it out for you. Yeah. Uh, we had a city that just got $22.5 million to prop up their local their local economy uh you know and and really uh, it's just that why that happened well urban sprawl big 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 blue collar businesses left offshore so when when you when you have a city and get decimated like that it it's hard to recover yep. so now uh the province has to step in and say listen are we in the next three years we can help you out there's conditions to that You've got to make, instead of, look, I want, we want a brand new 65-inch flat screen television. <laughs> Do you really need it? Yeah, you need to fix your uh, your roof because you get a hole in it. So why don't you look after your needs first? Yeah. And then if you're in a position, maybe knock off one of those wants. And that's where we get to. We got to build trust up with, with our, our uh, communities. It's, we get to say, look. We're in this together. Yeah. Sit down and and come to some decisions that's good for the region. Look ahead. You might lose a little in a short game, but in the long game, you're going to be sustainable. Yeah. And when you, the planners say, look, if you have a hundred houses on a street, the services, those hundred houses is paid for. But if you have one house on the same kilometer street, who's paying for those services? Yeah. But in this province. And I've always said, you always have a right to where you want to live. But there's cost to everything, whether you live outside the city or the town or villages or you live within. So we have to get at there the, the basic saying, the small community say, listen, just leave us alone, we're fine. Well, no, everybody's being touched by this. So as soon as we figure this out, we can get on the road to prosperity. Because as you know, Dennis, economic plan after economic plan and throwing money at this and throwing... But, yeah. Are we any? Are we? Are we? Are we any farther? Yeah. If you have a house, it's asset management. Look after your house. If you can extend, say, look, I might. If I look after things I, before I put any money in, I can get another five years out. It's just like the communities, asset management, and lean six sigma is yep. their business theories that 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 communities are now right across the country, the world are applying that with lean six sigma is doing things more efficiently. With less resources, and, and those resources you apply them when you really need them. With asset management, is is you know you look after it now instead of this life thing is twenty five years. Let's say, try to extend it to thirty years, yeah. so you're saving money. So that's where we got to get that. And there's some examples. Yeah, great. I great. Would, great. I, I would build on what Eric says there, and you mentioned trust two or three times. Yeah. Um, I'm writing a report on this process, and my tagline for the report is going to be innovation at the speed of collaboration and trust. Uh, stealing a line from Stephen M. R. Covey, who wrote a book, uh, trust, speed, something like speed at the, something at the Change speed of trust. Change at the speed of trust. Correct. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. But um, a specific example of that. I don't think you just wake up on a Monday morning and say, "Okay, I trust you now." Right. Yeah. Trust is built over through relationships and time. And I think one of the advantages we have in New Brunswick is that because we are one degree of separation. We can quickly build our reputation or destroy our reputation, preferably build it. Mm. But I'll give you one example, for a concrete a concrete example. So um, New Brunswick is divided into 12 uh, regional service commissions, right? So sort of by county, some of these regional service commissions have a larger center in them, like Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John, and some are rural, like Charlotte County and McAdam and Harvey are in one 
uh, Regional Service Commission. The Regional Service Commission in the southeast, so includes Moncton, Dieppe, and Riverview, but also includes uh, Capilay and Shediac and Hillsborough and Alma and, and uh, um, um, Sackville, for example. From a purchasing perspective, um, Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John work together to do buying on certain products and services that make sense to bulk buy on. Moncton does that with Dieppe and Riverview as well. But the smaller communities don't have an opportunity to do that. Hmm. So to pick something very simple, fire hydrants, for example, like Eric was talking about asset yes. management. So perhaps in 2018, Capel A needs to buy 15 fire hydrants, and Sackville needs to purchase 27, and Alma needs to purchase 15. Why not put in one purchase order for 52 yep. fire hydrants, right? They're going to get a savings. So this is where I think there's a lot of potential in the regional service commissions to play a positive role. And that particular regional service commission, because it's one of the largest, they have a lot of resources to be able to assist the smaller communities in their region. But these regional service commissions also work together. They meet once a month to compare notes and share best practices. Best practices. So who's to say that you can't pilot a program like that in the southeast, then maybe a year or two later, you've rolled that out into all of the, all of the smaller communities around the province. And there's, you know, there's, there's a, uh, a simple process that can happen, human-centered, a process-centered from a, you know, a community management perspective. It yep. uh, doesn't need a lot of IT to do that, right? You can use a spreadsheet at first, yep. but at least you're building, building relationships between uh, communities in, in one simple uh, context. Yep. Part of what you describe reminds me of conversations with Don Otario and Edouard Lane when we talked about CDC, up at San Cunimento of St. Anne, and local food grown and produced and it done as a social entrepreneurship program. And mm -hmm. that was three years ago we had that conversation. Um, I know that that southeast corner on their food management strategy are more integrated um, than we are here. So, that, you know, there are some things that um, we all have in common. So and one of them is food. So if you want to have a conversation or find a theme or a topic where everyone will almost get on the same page quickly, um, food will be one of those unifiers. Yes. Um, has that surfaced in your world? Well, yeah. Yes. And it's, it's, it's here. I mean, you, you see where the, uh, the, the gardens are, the public gardens. Well, people go in there and, and, and I'll say, it's open to everybody. We're, you know, we know some new, new, uh, new refugees and immigrants come into the city and uh, they'll walk. Or take the bus over and uh, and because they're used to that they'll grow their own food and vegetables yep. so that that's building you know people are more concerned now where their food comes from yep. and the fact that uh just it, it will be open it was announced that there's a teaching farm yep. over in the north side hayes hayes teaching farm. yeah yep. and that was from the, the old hayes property and uh, the owner seen some he, he he gave them a few years to get it up and running and he's seen a value in it so teaching people how to grow their own food so it's that comes up in several conversations here yeah. on the show because yeah. it's a great space yeah. for playing a little bit yep. um, so the decline of the family farm then the potential for the return of the family farm some 30 or 40 years later climate change going on for the food baskets of california or southern united states so the cost of your food is probably your biggest change in your consumer price index mm -hmm. is bigger than gas um and so and if New Brunswick imports 95% of its own food, can one of the future economic drivers finally be, um, we were identified forestry, fishing, and farming. That was New Brunswick. Forestry and fishing still carry a certain weight, but yeah. the farming one sort of disappeared, well, right? Yeah. So is there a window now in the next 20 years that we can get at, back at that? I would say soon. I'll let Eric go, but no, I'd, I'd like to no, count. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> we're having fun with this one. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not a food expert. I know how to eat it. <laughs> I can't grow a tomato plant. But uh, the the local food situation in this province is very complex, mm -hmm. right? You've got a lot of growers that have contracts with the Sobeys and the McCains. Yes. And there are a lot of systems in place to be able to address those markets. Then you've got a lot of smaller markets that it would be a real challenge to hit those larger distributors, but they can distribute to smaller yep. markets, for example. So... In talking to some local food experts, uh, one of the things that I'm learning 
is that one of the real opportunities is, the, uh, is lowering the transportation cost of local food. So a way to do that, you know, at one point in time, the word Airbnb and Uber is going to come up in this conversation. I think it did once already, is Uberizing local food distribution. So, for example, I don't know the exact prices, but you can guess it will be less than this. So let's say, for example, you've got a farmer with 100 pounds of tomatoes in um, Rexton, right? And he wants to get them to the market in Dieppe. That might cost, I'm picking numbers, so I could yeah. be correct. Let's say it's $100 to pick a number, right? To yep. ship that 100 pounds. Now, picture you've got someone in a truck driving from Miramichi to Dieppe. I'm sure that highway is full of trucks every day, right? Mm. With an Uber type app now, he goes tap, tap and sees that there's 20 or 100 pounds of tomatoes to be taken from Rexton to Dieppe. Uh, who's going to bid on this? I'll pick him up for 20 bucks. You know, that might be my gas money for the trip down, right? So now you're using the market and a, an app like that to be able to distribute food at a much lower cost to the market. Now, granted, there's, there's going to be uh, issues like, uh, you know, making sure that the, the containment is appropriate from a cooling or heating perspective, cross-contamination, the bonding of the drivers. But all that aside, you know, let's assume that can be addressed. Then with this app, you could actually monitor not only the reduction in cost of getting local food to, to our plates, but also the reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions so we're not hauling them 3,000 miles from the other side of the continent, mm -hmm. right? I'll leave you with one other number on this, and I'll let Eric take over. But I was driving back from Moncton one day, and I'd visited a local market in Moncton. I was doing the quick math, and I thought, you know, if every New Brunswicker spent $1 a day on local food or beverage, that would be a $275 million business. Can you tell me how many businesses in New Brunswick are doing $275 million, and, as and an just, example? And just to interrupt, as a soundbite, um, when Amanda Wildman and Ted Wiggins were on the show um, from the Farmers Union, National Farmers Union in New Brunswick, Amanda had a similar soundbite. She, and she had it from research. She had all her notes and stuff. If everybody spent $13 a week reallocated to buying local, it would have an impact on local farms of $100 million. I believe that. So Jeez. it's not even, you know, more spending. It's just reallocate to find local. So Correct. then you had a sourcing issue and, and all Correct. that. Correct. But, but she understood the bigger concept and then made it a simple message for people that if we want to solve our own problems, here's one of the avenues that we can go to solve some of our own economic challenges. Correct. Well, I take a different tack than this. And I can, I'm going to scare you. When you, <laughs> when you, when you said 95% of the food that people in New Brunswick eat, it's it comes imported. from afar. Yeah. Tomorrow we get that's gone. Tomorrow gone. Yeah. What do we do? Yeah, we have a three-day supply yeah. basically in the okay. grocery store. So that's gone. What do we do? Wow, things would change dramatically. <laughs> it goes back in the seventies when the energy. Oh, we thought we were okay. You know, cheap gas, forty-five cents a gallon. Yeah. Guess what? What do we do? Well, we reacted, mm -hmm. and now we're to a point where we get more oil and gas, and we know what to do with. We can't get it out fast enough. Yeah. So. If our food chain is, is taken away, then I believe that things will happen, and especially in a rural area, is that you'll see these firms pop up because now people see it as a business opportunity. Back in the oil crisis, we got to develop our own resources, and there's big money in it, yep. big money in it. So um, when you have something and somebody takes it away, and I liken that, uh, again, if to say, look, we get half hour to get to the border. Grab what you can and go. And by the way, <laughs> you get to yell at wife and say, "I gotta go." You gotta go too. Yeah. You might not see her again, or you know. And that happens. And yep. that happened when we had these Syrian refugees come in there, and they they didn't that know was, where their families that's were. True. Yep. And some of the atrocities were bad, and there was even more that they didn't want to talk about. Yep. So, when hmm. you take those 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 givens, you think are given away. Yeah. Things change dramatically, and you know we got to have food. We got to have and our water supply. If something happened to the city water supply, yep. we've got engineers that will go to the wall to protect the water supply. That's why we, and the province has a has has some real good rules around that that protects our, our well fields. Do we need strengthening? I don't know. I'm not I'm not I'm an expert, but yep. it's something that we got to protect. Yep. We got to eat and we got to drink. So I mean, we have to get smarter about that. Yep. Uh, yes. Really. Because at some point, following a trend pattern, um, that northeast corner of North America, so kind of go down Boston or Cape Cod and come all the way up to Gas Bay. That's like Shangri-La. Some friends of mine call that the Shire. 
because of all these other changes that are going to go on in other parts of North America. So, and we've got a 25 year or 30 year window to try to anticipate what's coming and, and, and shift accordingly. So more food production, ability to assimilate or integrate uh, more people who are going to move here because they are going to meet, it's coming, it's already started. And then how to maintain some of our, our local identity as well. And, and how do we adapt to have all those pieces fit in a place where, you know, some people would visit New Brunswick and think they're back in the 60s in, in some ways with how we go about things, which is part of the charm and magic of the place. Yes. So how do we not lose that, but still, are we so far behind we can leap ahead without the interim periods? And yeah. will this technology help us do that? Well, I think the technology, and sometimes you're a victim of your own success. Hmm. Okay? <laughs> and I give you, I'll give you two examples. One is... We've been, uh, our water supply. Yes. We've been doing a lot of work, conserve, conserve, conserve. So conservation goes down. Yeah. But as you know, fixed infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, I have to replace <laughs> it. Somebody's <laughs> got to pay for that. Yeah. So if, you're, if your revenues are going down, yeah. you still have a, we have an infrastructure deficit. So that's going. So, you know, yeah. because everybody's saving water, we're not getting the revenue to do that. So that means, well, we got to raise the rates. Yeah. People, what are you raising the rates for? Well, we yep. we can kick it down the road. We can kick the ball down yeah. to the next generation, yeah. but that's but, no good. And thanks for bringing that up because that's one of those lovely paradoxes yeah. that in general the public don't quite get their head around. They're more looking at the cost of running their household. They're trying to become more efficient with their household, and they don't quite know the collective impact of what they're doing on a system. <laughs> and then there's the other thing that that's irksome maybe for me i'll i'll take ownership of it we sometimes use language that's not appropriate in different sectors so for me a lot of business language has made its way into the government sector so when you're delivering a service for a community it's very different from running a business trying to earn a profit so there's yeah. going to be some losses built into it for the sake of equity back to the equity issue so your example of the hundred houses they pay for themselves hundred one houses you got a whole other thing that's the same as a hospital or a school. Yep. or You have to maintain those things in order to create a certain social equity. And that also ties to that we're happy living here because our government, whatever level, is looking after our collective needs. So the consumer or the household sort of needs to understand how those pieces fit. So that's why your water rates are going to go up. But keep doing your best practices because that's an important thing. I was trying to give you wiggle room to kind of give that up for the conversation. Or, well, yeah, well, 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 you're right because you know it's it's just because uh, somebody doesn't use our rinks or our swimming pool, or but I mean they use our hospital service, so we all pay taxes. That tax dollar, three levels of government collect it, all provide those services. Yep. So at some time in your life, you're going to access different services, and some you won't. But, you know, if you have extended family, your kids might be doing that. So, I mean, you've, it's it's far-reaching. Um, uh, the other one I was thinking of is our dumps. It's just garbage. And, oh, by the way, there's no politicians that like to cut ribbons on... on yeah, landfills. Well, 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 that's the theme. No, <laughs> landfills and, and pipes underground because <coughs> can't yeah, see yeah. where is it? Yeah, so there's, there's <laughs> another... $15 million dollars down Perfect. there. Perfect. So there's another change that needs to happen because one day that needs to be sexy because in a lot of our eyes, that already is sexy. Um, another past guest, Pat McCarthy, CEO of Recycle New Brunswick, when he was on two years ago and he can't get it to have any political traction because it's not sexy to cut a ribbon in front of something. He sees a business model and a business opportunity for a large-scale recycling depot done in the Sussex area where Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John mm -hmm. contribute because then you've got scale, and then you can get to the port of St. John to be doing some stuff. 300 to 400 full-time jobs, good-paying jobs, and he can't get anyone to pay attention to it because it's not sexy. Hmm. So, So... Will this technology help with that? Because we never didn't get into that. We can get into it now. The recycling end of things, there's food production, but then there's efficiency on plastics and, management, solid and, waste management. You know. And I think that's where data can play a big role in helping improve the efficiencies. Like Eric was mentioning earlier with Lean and Six Sigma and those types of tools, they, they were and are private sector tools to help companies become more efficient. Hmm. The city of Fredericton has saved a lot of money by implementing those types of tools. And I think that I don't think I know that the more data you have with which with which to make a decision or a presentation, especially when it's a boring 
thing, <laughs> yeah. right, uh, will get more people interested. The trouble with the lack of information, especially where we may perceive government services as being inefficient, uh, you know, you're getting taxed at a certain rate, you're getting getting uh, services at a certain rate, uh, but you know, as 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 uh, it becomes more challenging to to, to provide um, public services at any one of the three levels of government, uh, people are becoming more demanding. Uh, mm. You know, governments are challenged, business models are challenged. Mm. Uh, the more data you have, I believe, is going to is just going to really help improve how to manage those processes mm. uh, and I do believe it's very important as well to um, uh, make sure that all of these types of benefits from smart technologies benefit uh, the citizens and the businesses and, and the community in, uh, in large and in, in any given community uh, and from an investment perspective as well and not just mm. doing something just because so I think the more we're able to now economically grab data and use data, uh, the more informed decisions we can make, the more uh, creative and efficient we can be in delivering those services. Yeah. And it's when it, when it goes back to the politicians, you heard of six thinking hats? Okay, the thinking hat is the black hat, the white hat, negative, the positive, the yellow hat, uh, the, that strictly here's what we know. The blue hat sort of controlling the red hat is... What do you feel in your heart? The green hat, mm. alternatives, right? So you get all these hats and they come to a decision, but they forgot. Boom, the door blows open, in comes the gold hat. The politician said, oh, that's not going to fly, <laughs> not going to get elected. <laughs> all that work out the window. Yeah. So we got to get by that. So you got to yes. always keep, <laughs> when you sit down, the hat's thinking. Is, yeah. There's somebody going to come through that door and they say, yeah, that's good. I'm jumping on board and say, yeah. we're shutting her down. Yeah. So it's yes. getting right down to those, those what you're saying is, is truth and fear of losing a service, but give up a little here, you're going to get a lot down the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It really reinforces the message we can get more done together than we can Absolutely. go on our own way. And we're such a small place, yeah. but we have those old entrenched behaviors of yeah. which the one that always comes up is the old political behaviors. How do you make a, and I've had this conversation with all the political parties except the liberals haven't made it on here yet. Um, with how do you get at large-scale systemic change when you've got a four-year mindset to your thinking, and especially come the third year or your fourth year, which we're seeing that pattern reinforce itself again, where all this money starts to roll out. Thinking, But these challenges that you're looking at are large-scale and systemic, and your solutions still aren't large-scale and systemic. Well, let, let me give you it. I mean, <laughs> I'll take you from, from local government, and I think this would apply to every government. In local government, we hire people. We try to hire the best and experts. Yep. We ask for a staff report to come back. Here it is. Here's what we think as experts. Here's what we wrote. So if he said, forget it, then why are we hiring these people to give us advice when we ignore them? Yep. It's the same in the province. The deputy ministers are experts in the fields. You know, they, they, they want to push forward. They're the ones that will go 30 years. Yes. Right? They're the, 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 the last again. So why don't we pay attention to them? You know, that's the mindset you're talking about. That's what we got to get at. Yep. You know, if we hire these people to give us advice and they know what, what has to be done, then why are we ignoring it? Yep. Then it gets into the, the political genre. You know, what yep. makes a politician up? You know, what's a politician feel? Yeah. Are, are they, are they in, in to help people or are they in it just to... And wouldn't it be nice one day if when we use the word politician or politics, it actually has another feel to it completely? Because that's another shift that needs to occur. When we say that word, we have a, an, an understanding of it that isn't necessarily positive, right? And media tend to reinforce that. Um, Ten years ago, they do studies on the most trusted or least trusted professions. And Yahoo politicians beat out used car dealers for the <laughs> least trusted. You know, I still remember the headline thing. And you're playing cute, but that's a sad commentary because we count on the politician in the truest sense of or the highest value sense of that word to deal with the collective decision-making process that's supposed to benefit everybody rather than just feed a four-year election yeah. cycle. And that's yeah. what you're speaking to. And, I, and we might be right for that. And part of the solution, and heaven forbid New Brunswick do something new, but the thought of a minority government would be a fascinating thing at the provincial level because that's an offset mechanism or a counterbalance mechanism from the entrenched behavior of the political party process. So you wouldn't have to have political reform. You would just have to have a minority government for four years Pretty and enough. say... Time you guys start to work that out now. 
further. At, at the risk of using an overused term, I think vision is important, and I think one of the last great vision statements, for lack of a better word, or uh, was, I hate to say this, was John F. Kennedy mm -hmm. in, what, 1960 or 61, let's put man on the moon, right? And the USA spent eight or nine years through successive, uh, sadly, presidents, and they achieved their mission eight, nine years later, right? The trouble with putting man on the moon, it's that one thing you can get your head around. Let's win a gold medal in the Olympics. Let's win the Stanley yeah. Cup. Let's put man on the moon. But when, when you look at so many complex sort of connected issues, it's difficult to wake up in, you know, 25 years and say, okay, it's uh, January 1st, 2040 now. Tick, we're all happy. We have a good quality of life now, right? It's an ongoing process and not just that that uh, that gold medal at the end of the day, right? And that's what I, that's what I think makes it challenging. That's why I think vision uh, is a very important and having a strong leadership to say, okay, this is where we're going, right? And I think that's a, a very, very important element in, in uh, helping move a lot of these issues uh, towards a better place. Yeah, and, 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 and just to feed off that, it's, it's you know, the city's gearing up, the communities have to gear up with their internal systems. They have to get that sensor to provide that feedback. And that is, then it gets in the analytics. Hmm. You get this information, what is it telling you? Now, the, the, do we as a government, the local government, have to have the people to do that? Yeah, we can, but why don't we put it into the, into the free zone and then we have these startups and these these young coders come in there and hey did you look at this did you did you ever think of this yeah. and that's what's happening now there's a group called Civ Tech. civic tech civic yeah. tech, civic tech. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah i was going to bring them up I'm yeah glad you yeah did. it's it i was over there a couple of times and we've had some discussion because <laughs> they're part of this equation of being smart because yes. what they're Very doing so. and what they're providing they're providing say look we're providing free services back into the community to help the communities prosper using data you know and wouldn't it be nice as i said before as a politician and i can say that because i'm a local politician yeah. the more clear data we have to make a better decision that's better for everybody yep and do we have to do it no i mean there's people that will volunteer services and maybe there's a, a business opportunity might arise mm. pat right here in this province maybe in this city right across the country yeah. why do we have to wait for so many in, correct in other parts of the world come up yeah you know we're doing some great things here so we can't beat ourselves up too bad no but there are things we have to start paying attention to and you know fairness and you know sacrifice a bit and and play the long game as you say the four years are the short game but we got to think beyond that short game yeah. and just my opinion anyways that's great that's great Agreed. um time to wrap up how would you like to close this out well uh, as i say uh, um when you talk about smart communities it's I, I i think it's it's a movement uh coming our way uh the federal government is big time as you know the smart city challenge uh we're into a group of uh population un under uh half a million ten million dollar prize two ten million dollar prize so the communities are jostling for that. Uh, the big cities, they're in the big boy club. There's $50 million prize. So, uh, so the, the governments know what they have to do. They know we have to be smarter in what we do, and we'll get to that point. And with a little help and a little ingenuity, mm -hmm. we can get there. I think I've had the opportunity to talk to at least 100 people so far as a, uh, through this project scope. And... What's been wonderful about it is the people I've met are doers and they want to get things done. And, you know, typically you look at silos, right? And there are people in the energy sector and the people in the social services sector and people in the food sector and other sectors, and they, they tend to stick in their silos. Um, we're, ha we're having a conference on uh, March 28th here in Fredericton, and we're going to be taking people from various sectors that are all doers, and we're going to put them all in the same room. And I really think by making those connections in itself will really help accelerate a lot of this work where people may not have been aware of each other's work in the past, regardless of the sector. But as you know yourself, we all know here, you put a bunch of people in a room that like to get stuff done, it will get done. So that's how I would wrap up this session with you, Dennis. It's great. Thank you so much. A great conversation. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. 
Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.